Today we're going to talk about the four yogas, uh, the, the four famous, famous paths to spiritual freedom. And these four paths, very famous uh, Jnana Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, Karma Yoga, Raja Yoga. Uh, I'm sure these terminologies are not new to any of us, uh, or probably we've at least heard of these and wondered what those mean. Uh, the Jnana Yoga, people who follow that are Jnanis, the, that's the final state. Uh, the Yaraja Yogas are yogis, that's the final state. Uh, and bhakt, Bhaktas and uh, Karma Yogis. An interesting question to ask in the beginning is, what freedom is it promising? Because before we talk about the four paths, uh, Bhakti Yoga, Jnana Yoga, Karma Yoga, what freedom from what? Uh, if it's path to liberation, liberation from what? Does that mean bad things will stop happening to us if we are in any of these paths? No, bad things will continue to happen to us. Does that mean this world will disappear? Like some people say, enlightened means the world disappears. No, world will not disappear. World will continue to be there. Does that mean I should stop working or I should stop uh, engaging with the world? No, you should continue to engage with the world. So this is what the sages uh, talk about, confusing things. Nothing will change. Then what changes? Then what use are these paths for? Jnana Yoga, Bhakti Yoga. They say that bad things won't stop happening to you, but the suffering will stop. Uh, there is an ancient story attributed to the Buddha, but is also attributed to many people after that, which talks about the nature of suffering and what spirituality does to the nature of suffering. So it is said that we are all pierced by two arrows, you know, two arrows at the same time in our chest. But these two arrows represent two different things. Arrow number one represents what happens to us, say a calamity, say a, a, a loss of a family member, say a loss of uh, a business. Whatever happens to you, the world throws at you is arrow one. But there is also an arrow two that is pierced in us. Arrow two is the suffering that we cause ourselves, the suffering that our mind interprets, bases what the world throws at us, and the suffering that it causes ourselves. And what all of these parts that we're going to discuss today talk about is removing the arrow two out of our chest. And you also find that in real life, isn't it? The same event happens to two people, two people react differently. So the arrow one, though it seems like the suffering is because of arrow one, all of spirituality, and this is not just Hinduism, not just Buddhism, all of spirituality, including the Semitic religions, the prophetic religions, everybody speaks about arrow two, which is your, your interpretation of what the world throws is the reason of suffering. And the Eastern philosophy says the interpretation itself is because of your own mind. And if you have a hold on your mind, a grip on your mind, then the suffering ceases to happen. So all of spirituality talks about removing the arrow too. That bad things will continue to happen to you. But your suffering, you've gone beyond suffering into a permanent state of happiness. And, and that's the elusive state that all students, all seekers look for, isn't it? Some people find it soon. Some people find it never find it. Some people know it, but cannot experience it. Some people are interested, but cannot comprehend it. Some people are interested and can comprehend it, but can't put it to practice. Some people are able to put it to practice, but they can see spikes of that, but not a continuous level of happiness. So there are all kinds of problems. It's not that simple. If it is that simple, it, we all should be in eternal peace. So let's see why it is simple, why it is tough, what are the different practices, and uh, what may be an easy start for each of us. So what are these four paths of uh, freedom? What are these four paths that can remove the second arrow? Remember, not the first arrow. Of course, a philosophy like Advaita Vedanta, which is non-duality, would say the 
when you remove the second arrow you'll realize the first arrow never existed it was just appearance and the suffering was real for a for a first arrow that was just an appearance so for that is advaita that is the highest level of spiritual insight but all other philosophies as well say that the second arrow is the reason for your suffering there are four yogas and these four yogas or four paths or four methods um uh, are like four different pills four different types of medicine depending on the problem is when what you consume a medicine isn't it? all medicines are independently good and all medicines can independently cure what they can independently cure that particular problem for which the medicine was made so let's first look at what are these four paths and what are what are these made for and then let's go deeper spend 5 10 minutes on every path um and see uh, what are the, what is the fine print or terms and conditions that it comes with and uh, what path may be most helpful for you to embark on though all four paths are equally um lofty and equally important for followers of those paths now is the second arrow removed by jnana yoga jnana yoga is it says the problem is ignorance that you are already complete we have been looking at jnana yoga in the last few weeks of this class because krishna starts with jnana yoga in uh, bhagavad gita he opens chapter 2 with jnana yoga so we have been seeing jnana yoga so it stirs logic takes you from point a to point b it says point a is ignorance of who you are he says arjuna if you only know who you actually are all the suffering will end because you're already complete you're already the brahman you are ignorant of that fact and therefore this world this mind the suffering constant permutation combinations of your desires um this greed envy pride wrath lust gluttony all that is because of ignorance of who you already are which is your complete self so that is jnana yoga the problem is ignorance and the solution seems to be knowledge if the problem is ignorance nothing else can be a solution isn't it if the problem is not knowing something knowing something is the answer that is what jnana yoga says that the only way to spiritual freedom is infusing knowledge to dispel ignorance the error needs to be corrected and the error is um ignorance and then at the highest point of jnana yoga you'll realize brahma satyam jagat mithyam which is brahman the consciousness alone is and jagat all this world is mithyam we'll get that in another 5 10 minutes we'll go deeper into jnana yoga so that is jnana yoga taking you from ignorance to knowledge one path and this path is very effective for many people um uh, uh, bhagavad gita says yah pashyati vah pashyati he who sees sees when the penny drops it drops it's instantaneous isn't it unlike all the other yogas jnana yoga is instantaneous because to remove ignorance you need knowledge and when you have that knowledge ignorance cannot stay along with knowledge ignorance and knowledge are apart from each other it's like when you're searching for your keys in the house you are in ignorance of where the keys are moment you see your keys you find your keys that moment the ignorance gets dispelled it's not a process it's not it's not you know perform karma for 20 years or have bhakti for 20 years jnana yoga is instantaneous but it comes with terms and conditions <laughs> it takes years to be ready for that instantaneous jnana so we will get that the second yoga that we will talk about today is is that from the tradition of yoga itself uh, raja yoga you know the hindu philosophies uh, are many philosophies in hinduism there is no one philosophy the sankhya yoga nyaya vedanta all these are different philosophies very similar but different nomenclature different philosophies and raja yoga is derived from the philosophy of yoga which is patanjali yoga sutra and raja yoga says the point a to point b point a is that the problem is that our minds are scattered our minds are distracted our minds are everywhere at all times so solution therefore 
is focusing the mind. When you focus the mind, when you control the mind, like when a rider controls the elephant, we've seen this analogy the last few weeks, and the rider controls the elephant, trains the elephant, and, and, and stabilizes the elephant, then the rider overpowers the elephant. So Raja Yoga's objective is how do I gain control over the mind? How do I, how do I practice tapas, spiritual practice? And so that finally, the end goal is Samadhi. Samadhi is where you lose differentiation between the subject and object. You become one with consciousness itself. And that state, says Raja Yoga, is spiritual freedom. If you're able to be at Samadhi at all times during the day, at all times during your life, then there is no differentiation between you and even a jnani, even a jnana yoga person who realizes through knowledge that Brahman alone is, everything else is false. A person at Samadhi experiences the same. A Samadhi also comes with its USP, just like Jnana Yoga's USP is that it's instantaneous to come to us. If there's a flyer for Jnana Yoga, the Jnanis would say, we promise instantaneous results, terms and conditions attached, but instantaneous. The Raja Yogis would say, our USP, our flyer would state that this is the only path where we promise experience. The Raja Yogis may look at these Vedantic people and say, all you are mumbo jumbo talk, you talk about Brahma, Satyam, Jagat, Mithyam, but you haven't experienced anything yourself. Because you say that a mind, your limited equipment cannot experience the unlimited Brahman. So you only hope that one day through knowledge you will cross to the other side of enlightenment. But as a yogi, as a meditator, as a Raja Yogi, I can experience that oneness. That's the USP of Raja Yogi. So it's very powerful, very powerful. Not the yoga that's popular in the world today, which is just asanas. As we will see in some time, asana is one, is one part. In fact, it is the third out of eight steps in, in, in the Patanjali Yoga Sutra. So that is Raja Yoga. The advantage, it's experience. You can feel divinity. Um, again, terms and conditions attached. The third path of yoga is uh, Bhakti Yoga. Bhakti Yoga says the problem is that we can't focus our mind as simple as what Raja Yogis say because our minds are currently have desires which are all pointed outside. We have such worldly, outwardly desires, outwardly desires, isn't it? So everything that we want is out there. Name, fame, money, family, power, recognition. We want satiation of our desires which are all pointed outside. So Bhakti Yoga says the problem is, is, is desires pointed outside. So the solution, is not to make those desires inward. The solution is let's introduce an additional desire, which is also outward, but which trumps all the other outward desires. And let's call this desire God. So Bhakti Yoga introduces God. You realize none of the other parts even talk about God. So the purpose of all parts are not God realization. Bhakti Yoga talks about God specifically. And because Bhakti Yoga says, if the desires are pointed outward, what's the point of forcing your mind to point inward? Let's play with our weakness to our strength. Let's introduce another desire called God. And let's make all the other desires subservient to that larger desire. And thereby, since you're doing everything for God now, the problem was outward desire. The solution is all desires Put it on God. <laughs> Blame God for all your desires. <laughs> in fact, um, all religions which, which are anchored on faith, not just Eastern religions, even, even Judaism, Christianity, Islam, they're very most similar to Bhakti Yoga. Of course, there are a lot of dissimilarities, but more similar because they are built on faith. So a good Muslim, the definition is submitting your will to Almighty Allah. 
isn't it? Submitting your will to the Father in heaven. Similarly, submitting your will to a God. Again, an external God. Duality. So, so, so Bhakti Yoga stems from the philosophy of duality. Uh, the dual traditions, like the very, very, very staunch Vaishnavites, for example. High, very uh, high caliber of uh, Bhakti. Now, Bhakti also says that if you follow Bhakti, um, well, your second arrow will be removed. The arrow of suffering. The bad things may still happen to you, but it's all God for you. So you don't differentiate. The fourth yoga, before we get into each one uh, in detail, the fourth yoga is karma yoga. Now karma yoga says the problem is that even bhakti is tough. Because you may say you're doing it for God, but end of the day, it's your ego that is doing it. Uh, you are using all spiritual knowledge, but end of the day, you are doing what you want to do. <laughs> that is why traction is less, isn't it? We may know everything there is to know, but we will we will still do what we want to do. Uh, we may have a prayer room at home. We may have meditation space. We may have all the jnana in the world, but still, when push comes to shove, at the moment of dilemma, we continue to do what we are inherently our ego asks us to do. So Karma Yoga says the problem, guys, is that we have an egocentric, selfish take on life. So the solution to removing suffering is moving from a selfish take on life to an unselfish or a selfless take on life. When you drop the ego and, uh, and, and, and do what you ought to do, not what you want to do, or what your personality forces you to do, but do what the right thing to do, then, then you remove suffering because you understand it is all cause and effect at play, not really uh, overlaying your preferences. You don't get what you desire, you get what you deserve. That's what Karma Yogi believes that I don't get what I desire, I get what I desire, deserve, basis the buttons I have myself punched in the past. So that is karma, karma yoga. That is the fourth path. Now these are four paths. Now let's look at each of these in a little more detail. So somebody has asked, can you define these arrows once again? So probably some of you joined late. So these two arrows trace back to Buddha. It just says that we are all pierced by two arrows. But a lot of other people have said that after that as well, not just Buddha. Uh, or you can say two bullets, or you can say two whatever. But we're all pierced by two arrows. So one arrow is what happens to us, uh, what the world throws at us. It could be um, uh, it could be a disaster, calamity. It could be COVID-19. <laughs> it's cause of suffering. The second arrow is our own suffering that we create by our own mind. Uh, it is the suffering we cause ourselves. That's why one person suffers more than the other irrespective of the same um, objective cal calamity. As somebody recently said, it became viral, a post on Facebook and Instagram. It says, we are all in the same storm, but in different boats. We are all in the same storm, but please don't mistake that we are in the same boat. We are all in different boats. Somebody is in a boat that is leaking. Somebody is in a beautiful yacht who is observing the storm, but not getting affected by it. So similarly, the arrow one is common for all of us. Arrow two is our own self. And spirituality uh, is about remo removing arrow two. So Neetu says, isn't it unfair to say one gets what they deserve, considering so many traumas are endured for no fault of the individual? Yes, it is unfair when you look at it from your egoistic window of observation. I keep giving the example. If, if Can you mute yourselves, please? Yeah. So I keep giving this example in my previous classes, isn't it? If you, if, if your spouse or mother, whoever you live with, is watching a movie, and you enter the movie after the interval, not before the interval, after the interval, and then you see a guy getting beaten up, and you feel for that person, it's so unfair. 
and you start crying for that person you tell the person who was watching the movie from the first you say what unfair how can he get beaten how can anybody get beaten and that person says hey you fool you come in at this point in time and you're drawing judgments you're becoming the judge jury and executioner because of your ego you don't know how things have panned out in the last 2 hours i have watched the movie from the beginning and this guy you know what all he has done and he gives you a series of reasons why this guy is suffering these consequences then it makes sense to you saying that karma is not transactional justice it's resultant justice so we will talk about it when we get to karma yoga but good question it is unfair it is unfair christ says in the bible iniquity in life there shall be iniquity in life there shall be the reason because we are not born the same according to the hindu philosophies according to vedanta according to sankhya according to buddhism we are not born the same we are born as per our own temperaments as is our mind so is our will and that is why the second arrow is different for each of us because our temperament determines the suffering that we undergo through the second arrow a person who is naturally a generous person is not afraid of protecting every penny in his house or her house so the experience of the world is that the experience of the world is a very nice experience a person who is naturally stingy keeps suffering every day thinking that his wealth will be robbed so he is the he is his own de demon isn't it so as is his mind so is his world now so so not everybody is the same so of course in terms of law in terms of how we treat people everybody should be the same but all of spirituality not just eastern even western says people are not the same because your minds are different therefore your interpretation of situations are different so governments and legal systems can only ensure the first arrow is the same for everybody everybody is given equal opportunity or everybody is equally uh, facing difficulties the second arrow unfortunately the government or legal system cannot uh, have parity in that because that determ is determined by your own karma hope that answers your question now let's get into jnana yoga the first of the four lofty yogas the yoga of knowledge jnana yoga starts with jnana yoga is filled with um, filled with the uh, intellectual boomerangs because jnana yoga is would say it is a myth that you need these yogas to feel happy because in truth you're already free <laughs> we have been seeing that isn't it last few weeks is what yoga what four paths what jnana yoga you don't all these are only the traps if you say i'm following jnana yoga that's that's bondage that's not freedom if you say i'm bhakti yogi that's bondage that's not freedom because you're already free why are you doing all this to make yourself a slave jnana yoga would say the 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 purpose of life is not to become a spiritual person the purpose on life is to become free becoming a spiritual person however good a desire it is is still a bondage so jnana yoga would say focus on being free don't focus on being a spiritual person that is also a bondage and then second step jnana yoga would say you're already free so it is about realizing what you already are so vedanta there is a famous quote which says vedanta introduces you to what you already are and takes away what you never were <laughs> so it introduces you to what you already are and takes away what you anyway never were it seems um, it seems uh, you know you, that's like a consultant you know taking your watch telling you the time and asking you money for that so vedanta says uh, it is a nudge therefore to see what you are now vedanta or jnana yoga starts with two very important parameters viveka and vairagya viveka is the ability to discern or distinguish between what is real and unreal because everything else is cool and sexy about jnana yoga isn't it it says you are already brahman and all those things but how do you get there how do you get that point how can i realize that i am already complete i am not the void i am brahman itself 
So the first step is Viveka. Viveka in Sanskrit means discernment, discerning the real from the unreal. Viveka is not just a Vedantic practice. In Sankhya Yoga, the, 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 the bottom line of it is Viveka between Purusha and Prakriti. Purusha is consciousness, Prakriti is nature made up of your gunas. In Vedanta, it's a differentiation between the self and the body-mind intellect that we've been seeing over the last six weeks. So the first step is differentiation. See, if you have a, uh, if you're mining for a precious, precious, precious metal, precious stone, it is important for you to know what is gold and what is not gold, what is diamond and what is not diamond. And then you take what the diamond is and realize that's what you're looking for. If you don't know what something is, how will you know what you're looking for? So that is the first step of uh, Jnana Yoga differentiating between the real and unreal. And how do you differentiate? Jnana Yoga does that through logic, through, through high intellectual prowess. There are many methods. There are three famous methods in the Upanishads. How you can become a Jnana Yogi yourself. <laughs> I'm sounding like this typical American uh, uh, salesperson. How you can become a Jnani yourself. No, but it is true because knowledge dispels ignorance all it takes is an instant and if one of you in the call if your mind is so subtle through past karma and where you are now probably this little piece of knowledge can liberate you but for many of us it may take a long much more long time so let's look at what these three methods are and but we will look at only one in detail now because we also want to talk about the other yogas the very famous way of doing viveka which is separating the real and unreal is called drig drishya viveka drig drishya is is through the process of logic of examining the seer and the seen the experiencer and the experienced and this is what we look at in more detail it's very interesting so let's hold on to that there are other methods there is pancha kosha viveka pancha kosha viveka is understanding how the true nature has been enveloped by koshas koshas are sheets uh, the mind the body the intellect the deep sleep so we analyze the koshas and then realize what we are inside and then there is uh, uh, and there is viveka through analyzing the levels of consciousness the waker state the deep sleep the dreamer and then realizing Turiya, the fourth state, is what you already have. There are many ways of discernment or separating the real and the unreal, the permanent and the impermanent. Let's spend some time on Drit Drishya Viveka. Um, it, is, it is one of the simpler, there's nothing simple about Jnana Yoga, but among the three, it is, it is a little more uh, intuitive for all of us. Now, remember Viveka is still only the first step. Now, there is a step two and a step three to achieve liberation. But the first step is separating real and unreal. Now, Drig Drishya Viveka. Now, suppose I, I have a pen, right? You, you're able to see this pen? Yeah? For you to be able to see this pen, Let's let's go into the logic of experienced and experiencer. Sorry, I was just muting some people. So my eyes are seeing this pen. So remember, we are in jnana yoga. There is no emotion, bhakti, nothing. This is pure jnana logic. And for some of you, this may turn you on. Who does idol worship? Let's talk about jnana. <laughs> so 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 this is very intellectual. So experiencer and experience. This this seems like what. Ajay Krishnamurti, those kind of people talk about. But no, it's actually not that complicated. Lot of people can easily understand it. Give it, give it some time, concentration. Uh, reach out to people who already understand it. And you will understand it. Vivekananda said, a lot of people understand. Very few actually become. And the problem is step two and step three. But understanding Vedanta or Jnana Yoga is not that difficult. So, we are seeing this pen. What are seeing this pen? Your eyes are seeing this pen. 
So what is the experienced and what is the experiencer between this pair? Obviously the pen is being experienced. It's the scene and the seer is your eye, the experiencer, isn't it? So you're already separating and this is an easy separation. It doesn't require jnana yoga to separate, but you're able to separate what is being seen, the object of experience, and the subject of experience is the I between this pair. And, in, and on which side is consciousness on? You would say, would you say I am the pen or I am the eyes? You would always take the side of the experiencer, which is the I. I am the I seeing the pen. Now let's go to the next pair. The eyes themselves, are they the experiencer or are they also the experienced? The eyes are also experienced, isn't it? Because eyes are just sense organs. The eyes take the picture of this pen. Uh, they, the retina does its own work. It sends electrical impulses in my brain. And the electrical impulses get converted to a picture in my mind. And the mind gives me sensations depending on what this picture is. So it makes me, if it's an apple, it may make me hungry. If it's a picture of a loved one, it may make me happy. The mind converts all of this. So between the eyes and the mind, trig drishya, what is the scene and what is the seer? The eyes are the seer and the, sorry, the mind is the seer and the eyes themselves are the scene. Now the second, now the differentiation gets, keep getting subtle as we go inside to understand who am I? So the mind is the seer and the eyes are the scene in this pair. Now, this separation also we can understand. Now let's go deeper. Now this is where the confusion comes because normally all of us stop here. So I am the mind. I'm able to see through my sense organs objects. So the eyes see the pen. My mind sees the eyes. The mind perceives the eyes. It interprets the eyes. There is a subject object divide. The eyes are the object. We know that because we know that the eyes can be taken out, transplanted, or you know, whatever it is. But the person can still live. So you can't say, I'm the eyes. I'm the mind because the mind does not have a location. But let's analyze this a little deeper. It gets interesting. Are you really the mind? Because the mind also is just thoughts, experiences feelings, these are all matter as well. These are all objects of experience. So how do you know? Because you know that you are being happy. You know that thoughts come and thoughts go. You know that you're feeling upset. You know your own memory. That's why you're able to pull from it. So the mind also is just an assortment of thoughts, feelings, emotions, which are matter. It needs consciousness to illuminate it. And then it becomes thoughts, then it becomes feelings. So if consciousness is not illumining it, then it is inert. A chemically inert substance is, is, is what is unreactive, isn't it? Similarly, mind is inert unless it's illumined by the I, I'm able to experience it. So there is again a divide between the consciousness, which is the I, the feeling of the feeling of who I am and the mind which is the composition of my personality and when consciousness illumines the mind i experience the mind i am happy i'm sad i'm aditya you are whoever you are now that is the state so there's a pen the eyes the mind and consciousness itself now that is first step a differentiating between the consciousness and all objects of experience. Now, at this state, the consciousness, the last state that we talk about, the witness, the sakshi, it's called the sakshi, the witness. Now, at the state of sakshi, there is no more separation because you've become the subject itself now. The mind was object one, the eyes were object two, and the pen was a distant object three. But all are objects, just closer to you and farther to you, but all are objects of experience. You are the witness conscious alone, experiencing these objects, illumining these objects <clears throat> that give it life and that give it experience. <clears throat> the second step of Jnana Yoga after in Viveka 
<coughs> is vairagya once you know <coughs> who you are who you actually are there is a natural dispassion towards objects of experience you are the subject and you were always the subject so you are not so enchanted by the objects of experience anymore. but for that let's understand um, between the pen and the eyes was the pen required for the eyes to see or the eyes were required to see the pen the eyes are required for the pen isn't it the pen is not required for the eyes to exist but the, without the eyes there is no perception of the pen so the eyes is more real between the mind and the eyes will the mind exist without the eyes or the eyes exist without the mind you realize the mind is more important because the mind is more permanent uh, without the mind you can't interpret the eyes but the uh, eyes can't recognize the mind the mind can recognize the eyes so you take away the mind you're not only taking away the eyes you're taking away the pen as well so in that order if you take away the mind everything that it perceives till the last mile gets taken off similarly if you take away the witness consciousness the entire world falls back into yourself there is no world apart from what this witness consciousness illumines this is not even advaita yoga that's step 3 this is the second step understanding that it is consciousness that illumines the entire world there's nothing that can get illumined without that life power the consciousness that you are and which is so intimate to you it is the most intimate yet it is the farthest thing because of its difficulty to understand when you don't stop at recognizing yourself as just the mind when you ask what is illumining these thoughts feelings emotions you realize it's that witness sakshi consciousness itself so step 2 is understanding if you take away witness nothing exists if you take away the pen the witness still exists if you take away the eyes the witness still exists if you take away the mind in deep sleep every night we experience it in our own sleep the witness continues to exist it is just not illumining anything it does not have a mind to illumine in the night but the witness continues to exist but if you take away the witness none of the other things exist that is step 2 now many philosophies sankhya stops here yoga stops here but vedanta goes further and we to wrap up jnana yoga i'll just give you step 3 of vedanta vedanta says witness consciousness alone is everything else is just an appearance in the witness consciousness meaning think we have seen the bra bracelet and gold example haven't we suppose i give you a bracelet and suppose i tell you that your actual substance is only gold now does the bracelet actually have any pith and substance it does not have any pith and substance it's just nama roopa isn't it bracelet is just an appearance of the gold now the gold exists even after the bracelet dies and it existed even before the bracelet was born meaning if you melt the bracelet it's still gold if you make the bracelet into a ring it is still gold the gold always exists bracelet was just name and form now can you separate the bracelet and the gold you cannot because there is no bracelet without the gold is there gold without the bracelet of course there is but is that bracelet without the gold of course there is not so there is no independent existence of the bracelet without the gold the bracelet is just an appearance the name and form of the gold the bracelet has no independent pith and substance apart from the gold where does the bracelet need to realize if the bracelet is told you are the gold where will the bracelet go find the gold outside it can search the world but it cannot find gold because it is already the gold the gold alone is and the bracelet was is and will be the gold and the bracelet's job is to realize it has no independent existence or reality apart from the gold and the bracelet is already the gold that is what jnana yoga is we started off isn't it 
becoming a spiritual person is a bondage because you're already free. Your job is to understand that you are already free. That is Jnana Yoga. We can keep going on with Jnana Yoga, Panchakosha, Viveka and all those things. But the first two steps of Jnana Yoga is Viveka and Vairagya. The ability to discern and separate the real from the unreal and the ability to latch on to, 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 to the real. And the Vairagya is the ability to therefore be dispassionate about the unreal. Now the problem with Jnana Yoga is that many Jnanis understand Jnana Yoga very well. If you give it enough time and if you're an intellectual person, you understand Jnana Yoga and it's highly, uh, you, it gives you a lot of joy to just understand because you take, I also love physics and I love quantum physics, particle physics, um, um, string equations and, uh, and relativity. It is highly intellectual, but if you understand Advaita Veda, that is even more intellectual than even quantum physics in terms of the rigor required to capture it, right? But does that liberate you? No. Because Jnana Yoga runs the risk of intellectualizing it so much that you've lost the plot. So many Jnanis can still be upset and irritated and dejected with the world. Because you intellectually grasp the truth, but you're still holding on to the world. The Vairagya doesn't accompany Vivek. Vairagya is, if you realize something is real, why would you hold on to the unreal? <laughs> if you hold on to the unreal, which means you don't have conviction in your own intellectual realization. And that is the problem with Jnana Yoga. Now, one of the reasons why this is tough is because our minds are scattered. So we intellectually realize, but we cannot become one with Brahman. And therefore we go into Raja Yoga. The second yoga says the problem is, is the scattered mind and the solution is the focused mind. And then the focused mind has more chance of knowledge being received without intellectualizing it alone. Now Raja Yoga comes from Patanjali's Yoga Sutra. So it is from the yoga tradition. So the six schools of philosophies, philosophies are also called um, in Sanskrit darshanas. Darshana is philosophy. The six schools of philosophy is called astika philosophies because astika is orthodox, which is Hindu organic philosophies. Different schools of thoughts, but organic. <laughs> There's also nastika schools, which is unorthodox. Buddhism, Jainism, which became offshoots. Because Buddhism denies the existence of Atman. There is nothing called self, Shunya. Hopefully someday we'll talk about it. Um, all Astika schools, Hindu philosophies, talk about the existence of the self, the con witness consciousness. In that there is Sankhya, there is Yoga, there is Vedanta, there is Nyaya, there is Vimamsa, a lot of philosophy. Yoga as a philosophy is what Raja Yoga talks about, not Vedanta. But yoga is the philosophy, which is Patanjali Yoga Sutra. Patanjali, the great sage, which some of you might have heard of. Patanjali contributed a lot of things. Patanjali contributed the science of the mind, which is yoga, through Yoga Sutras. There are 195 Yoga Sutras. Patanjali contributed the science of grammar. Patanjali also contributed Ayurveda. So Patanjali is therefore a pretty awesome guy. <laughs> Was an awesome guy. Now, let's focus on Patanjali's yoga, which Vivekananda famously called it Raja Yoga. So Raja Yoga itself as a title, it, 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 does, it does not predate um, you know, Patanjali or it does not go back too many years. Vivekananda famously called it Raja Yoga, but it is called the yoga tradition. Yoga means Raja Yoga, right? Um, Jnana does not automatically mean yoga. And a yoga, we say, because of the meaning of the word yoga is union, knowledge that leads to union. But when you just say yoga, it means Raja Yoga, meditation. So meditation, according to Raja Yogis, yogis, meditation is the key to enter the kingdom of heaven, which is moving from a scattered mind to a focused mind. Now the Yoga Sutras say that, again, it says the same thing as Vedanta. It says there is consciousness and then there is nature. 
but yoga as a school is a dualistic tradition remember yoga as a school is a dualistic tradition not a non dual not an advaitic tradition meaning yoga says there is purusha which is the consciousness that you are and there is prakriti which is your nature which is your gunas sattva rajas tamas and your prakriti your nature because of its composition of sattva rajas tamas creates your buddhi your ahankar your mind so somebody is asking is raja yoga the physical yoga <coughs> no raja yoga is meditation and physical yoga is a part of ashtanga yoga we'll get to that in a few minutes but it's one among eight uh, steps not uh, the current where yoga lo if you are a yogi if you're doing asanas no uh, that's a distorted way to say yogi the yogis would uh, take offense to it not the yogis who read samadhi they wouldn't care <laughs> so the yogis would take offense so the patanjali yoga sutra says that you are the there is a consciousness and there is prakriti both are true remember it's duality it's not non duality say both are real they exist independently the consciousness and prakriti which is nature the problem is the prakriti because of its composition creates the mind body and intellect in fact it doesn't say bmi here it says buddhi which is the intellect ahankar which is the i and uh, manas which is the mind and the constant modifications of this chitta chitta is a combination of the intellect ahankar and the mind the constant modifications of it the vritti that creates unnecessary suffering so a raja yogi's objective is to meditate himself or herself to get out of these constant modifications in the word of the yoga sutra it says cessation seizing the constant modifications of the mind enables you to achieve oneness between purusha and prakriti remember it is not saying that prakriti never existed that is non duality purusha alone is that is non duality yoga says that prakriti and purusha become one identity in the state of samadhi which is the final state of meditation so it says it's not about knowledge it is about controlling the mind and how do you control the mind through meditation now interestingly uh, advaita vedant vedantin would say don't don't waste time on controlling the mind the mind's job is to the mind's job is to uh, uh, wander you focus on knowledge the moment you realize you are brahman you are no more interested in the mind that is the way to self realization the the raja yogi would say no controlling the mind is the way to achieve samadhi it's interesting isn't it different philosophies patanjali would say that there are many famous raja yogi just well. now the way to control the mind is one of the way famous ways is ashtanga yoga eight limbs to yoga ashtanga yoga is not the famous ashtanga physical yoga alone eight limbs to yoga now what is ashtanga yoga uh, the eight limbs to yoga has yama niyama asana you heard of the pranayama it goes to dharana dhanya and finally samadhi it says start from external disciplines yama then internally disciplining yourself which is niyama the third step is asana asana it says that now it focus on your posture focus on your physical well being and posture without the right posture your mind won't be focusing on the mind on, on, your mind can't focus on what is important if you don't focus on the posture that's where asana yoga as an asana comes in the physical yoga comes but it doesn't stop there it goes to pranayama you would have heard of pranayama as well the typical breathing techniques where it's the see asana and pranayama a multi billion dollar industries asana and pranayama multi billion dollar industries because that is uh, uh, easy to uh, do and understand which is also very useful 
remember nothing is wrong everybody is trying to struggling to attain peace and attain salvation so one of the most important things in your own spiritual path is don't look down upon any tradition or any path even if that feels that even if you feel that if you have a better and jnana is important not breathing technique no don't look down upon it. everybody is struggling to find their answer so yoga says asana is the third step which is the posture pranayama is the fourth step which is mastering your own breath prana is the life force the life energy after that is pratyahara pratyahara is withdrawal you know once you master your breath you start withdrawing from the world withdrawing from the world remember this yoga advaita would say go enjoy the world if you realize you are brahman go enjoy the world you are not going to be hostage by it yoga would say withdraw from the world because world activates your mind you want something to deactivate your mind so withdraw from the world after pratyahara is dharan concentration dharana means concentration and then you get into dhanya which is an absorbed state where you are completely completely apart from the world you are in your own state and that finally leads to samadhi samadhi is when the prakriti is dissolved it exists it's real but it does not create a constant mind body and ahankar prakriti is in its sublime state and there you can experience according to raja yogis you can experience oneness with purusha and that state where you feel oneness and raja yogi say you can experience that unlike all other four yogas only this is where you can experience that final liberated feeling of samadhi through intense meditation now i have tried meditation myself it's very difficult for me i need to uh, i need to accept it's not that simple meditation is not simple because you are trying to your scattered mind you're trying to focus it you're focusing it through your scattered mind it's difficult however meditation does not mean it is only half an hour a day actual raja yogis try to be in a meditative state all through their lives in fact for a person who has mastered meditation it is very difficult to be unmeditative <laughs> it is very very difficult to be unmeditative because you're always in a state of tranquil meditation to engage with the world requires more effort than to be in a meditative state and that is true with all yogas so even in a, a jnana yoga uh, there is a sage who met a king and the and the king said oh sage you have sacrificed so much you have left all worldly possessions the sage said you fool you are the bigger sacrificer i have not sacrificed anything because i have only given up the unreal for the real you have given up the real for the unreal what a great sacrifice that is <laughs> see how perspective changes so you and i are holding on so much to the world and our freudian slip or the freudian bargain is that or or as christianity would say for the judas who who gave up christ for the romans for 30 pieces of silver he christ with his 12 12 disciples were hiding from romans and nobody could find where they were and judas is the guy who who gave up the location isn't it? without gps he gave up the location for 30 pieces of silver so there is a famous thing saying for 30 pieces of silver you've given up the christ in you what a bad bargain that is similarly the sage tells the king i have given up the unreal for the real you have given up the real for the unreal what a bigger sacrifice you are making similarly the raja yogi would also say it is difficult to be unmeditative it is difficult to give up yourself to the world it's easier to be meditative from this side of meditation for the initial people it's difficult to concentrate but there are a few things which all raja yogis agree on in fact meditation is not just um, Uh, yoga tradition meditation is in all traditions of the world sufistic islam meditate japa meditation all nearly all branches of uh, in uh, hindu religions some people use the beads whatever you want some people meditate by singing 
So anything where you lose yourself and focus a scattered mind can be called meditation. And in your own art and karma yoga, you will see a beautiful blend in the next few minutes where if you live in this meditate, meditative state, not just by meditation, but through your own profession, that's karma yoga. If you're able to engage with your own profession with such focus, like how a yogi would engage in meditation or japa or mantra, that is karma yoga, highest form of uh, work and action. We'll get there. But that is Raja Yoga. We've finished. We're going to accelerate because of time. Uh, but that is Raja Yoga. So Raja Yoga has few conditions that may help the beginner, which is, uh, uh, which is it's useful. And I this I have observed in my own life is have a time and uh, place uh, to start meditation. Um, uh, anytime. It does not need to be only four. There are some inflection points in the day which is supposed to be auspicious which marries with the circadian rhythm of the body. Um, but anytime, uh, a time is important. Uh, a place is supposed to be important, um, which is, that's why people have room, prayer room, meditation rooms, even organizations. Now meditation is a multi-billion dollar industry. I am, as a consultant, invited so many times. Can you speak on uh, uh, mindfulness meditation? Uh, can you speak on um, uh, trait based meditation uh, but most of them talk about just you know an after lunch uh, uh, entertainment uh, when senior leaders meet for an offsite or something let's do an after lunch medi uh, meditation or mindfulness thing and checkbox <laughs> so that's not samadhi but that's useful everything is useful there is nothing that is not useful you know you should catch any of the five buses isn't it? what's worse is not catching any of the bus so any start is a good start the problem with raja yoga is that just like jnana yoga could lead to intellectualization pure meditation alone can lead to ego of meditation you know yogis hate to be disturbed when they are meditating the famous stories of rishis when somebody disturbs the rishi they give a curse shab right so yogis are traditionally supposed to be short-tempered because they develop this ego of power of meditation that they hate to engage with the world. They hate it because they have controlled their mind. Remember wisdom, jnana yoga is not controlling the mind. It is realizing the truth. But yogi is controlling the mind. So they hate to come out of samadhi. So when they are asked to engage with the world, it is a very displeasure this pleasurable experience for them. So that is the drawback. Because true liberation, even through samadhi, needs to be letting go of the world, which is you're always in love with the world. But yogis, when wrongly done, can um, cause more displeasure. The third yoga is bhakti yoga. Now, bhakti yoga is the most beautiful among four yogas. Because bhakti yoga plays to our own weakness as a strength. It says, don't, you don't need to become a professor and learn logic and learn all the arguments. For what? You're not experiencing joy in your life as a jnana yogi. You don't need to, you know, control yourself so much, withdraw from the world like a raja yogi. All you need to do is maintain all your outwardly desires. Add one more desire. Add the desire of God. Remember, this is the only place where God is coming in. Add the desire of God. Now, direct all your other desires to God. Divinize all good desires. And if you div divinize all desires, you can, never, you can never do anything without it connecting to the larger desire called God. So problem solved, done. You've eliminated ego, you've eliminated everything. Now, Bhakti Yoga is our people who, who, who see, say, Krishna in everything or their own object, any, any. Uh, if you're able to see the Christ everywhere. If you're able to see Allah and everything. Or whatever it is. Whatever your God is. You have divinized God. It's an external God. Remember? It is external. The question is, is external God unreal? Right? A jnana yogi would say, what external? There is nothing external. But you're saying God is external. Krishna is external. Uh, Shiva is external. Now, 
bhakti yoga truly und- a person who understands bhakti not just the ritualistic person a person who understands bhakti yoga would say you are right everything is maya everything is illusion but there are two kinds of maya there is vidya maya there is avidya maya vidya maya is maya which spirals upwards which which helps you get out of the world and removes the second arrow the suffering avidya maya maya is what takes you more outward into the world it multiplies desires it 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 fabricates greater samsara it takes you into the samsara and vidya maya pulls you away both are false <laughs> both are maya there is no god that exists the object that you are worshiping it's not god it is just a piece of wood if you if you are too attached to it that's the problem of bhakti yoga uh, just like inter- intellectualization was the problem with jnana the ego is the problem with uh, raja yoga the problem with bhakti yoga is we stop with uh, becoming emotional about god uh, we become um, slaves to that object of worship and not bhakti uh, so bhakti yoga introduces an external desire but which subsumes all other desires and therefore how can you be so let me ask you a question how will you behave in front of a person you look up to you know your ceo that you admire or your or your parents whoever you admire you would want to be in your best behavior in front of them isn't it now how would you behave in, if god is everywhere with you the god which you love which you worship he is or she is that god is 100 times more important than even the biggest mentor that you have in this world your behavior will always be pristine now that is what is bhakti yoga now bhakti yoga has this huge advantage among all four yogas because bhakti yoga says with love with devotion you can bypass sadhana which is you can bypass all these tough ritualistic practices of jnana yoga and raja yoga you don't need to understand drit drikshya viveka you don't need to understand pancha kosha viveka you don't need to understand samadhi and yama niyama asana darshana dhyana sama you don't need to understand any of that just infuse love into your life and love to god is love to everybody now bhakti yoga is also tough because it takes away the license for you to complain about anything in your life a truly bhakti yogi because he or she sees sees krishna in everything or your own ishta devata in everything ishta devata is you can choose your deity and but see that deity everywhere you also lost the license to complain as the example which we saw last week is ramakrishna paramahamsa when he had throat cancer when he was dying the disciple asked um uh, isn't it paining he said of course it's paining my throat is paining then why are you still so happy swami ji he said that is also mahakali that is also kali he is a ramakrishna was a bhakti yogi so he says how can i see kali in the good things and not kali in the bad things everything is kali so it is all leela gods my gods play remember bhakti yogis personalize god they say it's my god and that my god gives so much of love to their god and for them god is most important than even their own life god is more important than even their own close ones life because it is my god my krishna my shiva my rama and therefore if i get a throat cancer there is also rama's play rama's leela krishna leela if i get a jackpot that is also krishna leela i have submitted my will to krishna and if i do that with love krishna says don't worry about other things don't worry about knowledge don't be jealous of that jnani who seems to be more intelligent even ms subalakshmi sings in kure yondru millai uh, that very famous song in tamil which was composed by um, shankaracharya uh, he says there is no short, there is no limitation to a person with bhakti because god gives you that jnana that you require you don't need to understand arguments like a grammar to understand jnana krishna says yoga kshemam vahamyam 
yoga and kshema which is what you want and preserving what you have god will give you that knowledge god will give you that so even bhakti alone in its highest pristine form is enough for self realization because at that form of bhakti where everything is god your your there is no outwardly desire that doesn't go through god then krishna says yoga kshemam bahamya i will give you that last bit required for self realization i will give you that knowledge you don't need to go in search of knowledge so true bhaktas also realize that the second arrow doesn't exist for bhaktas anymore that is bhakti the problem with bhakti yoga is that the entire bhakti movement in india overtook the jnana movement they saw each other as opposites they saw each other as um uh, as uh, uh, antonyms which is which is what the mistake is because the goal is the same the second arrow gets removed we have 6 minutes so we are going to jump into i can speak much more about bhakti yoga but I'm going to jump into karma yoga the problem with bhakti yoga is that you get emotion but remember the potency of the combination jnana yoga the problem with jnana yoga is there is no emotion involved it's pure anal analysis so jnana yoga people can be irritating as well try infusing love in jnana yoga the difficulty in observing all these intellectual practices dissolves see for a person with love effort is natural like a parent isn't it i am not a parent but if you are a parent you may realize so this is for me heard example not personal example the parent always claims that the parent never says that i'm practicing love with my child no love is natural so when love is natural effort is also natural the disencumbrance that you feel is natural so jnana yogi finds it difficult to you know practice knowledge raja yogi finds it difficult to practice stability of mind a bhakti yogi says for me there is no difficulty because what there is difficulty it's all krishna so bhakti yogi one bypasses the difficulties of terse logic and intellect but the problem is you get too emotional in that process you forget that what you are worshiping is also maya but vidya maya a karma yoga the last of the four famous yogas karma yoga says the problem is selfishness it's an egocentric take on life you're trying to overlay life with what you will have it do not what life will anyway offer you life will happen whether or not you wish it to happen in a certain way we say we get what we deserve not what we desire all those things are karma yoga a karma yoga says that karma yoga is so important for us you and i these 50 of us in this call because all the other three yogas are performed in isolation solitude quietude nyani having realized the self secludes themselves in the himalayas <laughs> so the cliche himalayas the raja yogi is you know very is anti world so to speak so is in the caves meditation austerity the bhakti yogi is is unto themselves and krishna everything is krishna they are happy just sitting in a corner of the world with their own god only the karma yogi is trained to engage with the world so if you are a person who has to engage with the world if you don't have a cave for yourself in an island where you can be in solitude or if you have desires that needs dispensing karma yoga is the way for us because karma yoga spiritualizes work it doesn't spiritualize just thought or bhakti it spiritualizes work that's why karma yoga is so powerful what karma yoga says is that the way you perform work determines whether the second arrow is uh, piercing you or not if you perform work with a egocentric take on life you're doing two things one is you are multiplying those desires which actually required expression meaning you're adding to the samsara in your own life you're adding to problems in your own life and number two it says when you have an egocentric take on life 
subsequent contacts with the same object gives lesser and lesser desire sorry happiness so so your first day in your job gives you a lot of happiness the 10th day in your job you already bored you buy a car the first day you're so happy of course it makes you happy but the 10th day you're already looking at some other car your first day in your you win a jackpot you're happy you win 1 crore 1 million dollars you're happy 10th day you've lost happiness anything it seems like anything we engage with the world has a shelf life of happiness and karma yoga says it's because not because of the world don't blame the jackpot don't blame the car don't blame your boss blame the way the attitude with which you're engaging with the world the karma yoga says you can i'm going to take 5 more minutes um, karma yoga says that you can engage with two attitudes karma yoga through jnana karma yoga through bhakti remember karma yoga says it's the attitude with which you engage with the world that matters if bhakti and jnana are pure sciences karma yoga is applied sciences the so bhakti and jnana are phd's in science <coughs> karma yoga is engineering it says how do you apply those yogas to to actual life so karma yoga through jnana says that understand this is not jnana of the self that is jnana yoga this is jnana of the world which is karma you see there are two jnanas that are important in life one is the lower jnana which is how the world works which is causality cause and effect that is karma the second jnana is what lies outside of karma which is atman brahman brahma satyam and all those things so karma yogi is not as concerned about that reality karma yogi is concerned about the truth of this world karma yogi understands that every effect is backed by a cause and every cause necessarily produces an effect and therefore if i punch the right buttons now obviously i'm creating a better world for myself in the future i cannot expect results without punching the right buttons today that is karma yoga through jnana and therefore if i want to if i want to be a successful consultant at work i need to ask myself that is the effect what is the cause what is the buttons i need to punch now that is karma yoga <laughs> to understand that i am working on the right effort and i'm not sitting back and just waiting for the result to happen i want a happy life that is an effect karma yogi will ask i don't care about the effect what is the cause what is the effort that will lead to that effort so when you're able to see life as a series of causations cause leading to an effect effect leading to effect becoming the cause for another effect then you ask what are the right buttons so then you're totally dispassionate about the effect the results the only thing you are passionate about is the cause the effort and therefore there is no disappointment isn't it that's why krishna says there is no loss of effort arjuna if you are a karma yogi loss of effort happens only if you are disencumbered with the result there is no loss of effort if you are a karma yogi because that even if you lose your business you ask yourself what i see is the effect what should have been the cause or tomorrow if i want to be successful what should be the effort now so your focus is always on the action and a person who focuses only on action has nothing to do with the results but that doesn't mean that person is agnostic to results so that's the subtle thing because when you talk karma yoga people feel oh is results not of course it's important but to get the results where should the focus be on right effort and when you're wedded to the right effort then the effort itself becomes its own joy like we saw in few weeks ago that is karma yoga through jnana through understanding karma causation there is also jnana it requires intellect isn't it to understand causation but there is another way of karma yoga karma yoga through bhakti karma yoga through bhakti is saying that i will take i am holding the world with both hands i will take one hand and hold it on god i will take one hand and hold it on god and i'll keep another hand on the world which means i will abase my ego not by understanding causation causality all that is true but i will abase ego by 
assuming work is worship itself. I love this example that Swami Sarvapriyananda gives. He says he was in a, a airport once, and uh, uh, airport, you know, frisk people, especially people who wear uh, weird uh, clothes, and he wears the orange gown, and uh, he was frisked at the airport. And uh, this airport guy is a little, you know, irritable guy because you know he's frisking people. Thousands of people every day. Imagine if that's our profession. You would feel sad, isn't it? So uh, Swami Sarvapriyananda goes and stands there and he raises his hand and this guy does this. And, and then he sees Swamiji and says, who are you? What do you do? And he says, Swamiji. He says, okay, speak something. <laughs> uh, make, how, do you, how do we become happy? This is happening in the airport. It's an empty time of the day. So they were able to do this, it seems. So the Swamiji asks uh, this, this airport security guy, do you do puja in the morning? And they're all together now in a huddle. There's only this one customer there. So this airport security guy says, yes, we do. I do puja. I do puja to Hanumanji every morning. And Swamiji asks, how do you feel? He feels, I feel divine. In the morning between 6 to 6.15, I offer a garland to Hanumanji. I, I put flowers, I worship. Swamiji says, how is the rest of your day? He says, what Swamiji? I mean, this, doing this for 20 years, it's a... I'm irritated. I'm sorry if I irritated you. Swamiji says, let me tell you something. Given a chance, you will do puja to Hanuman all through the day, isn't it? He says, yes, of course. If only I had that luxury, I will do puja to Hanuman. He says, each time you frisk a person or, you know, use that sensor to uh, look for uh, metallic items and stuff. Think that that person is Hanuman in front of you. And you are offering a garland to that person. <laughs> so each now, how many times you have an opportunity to serve uh, Hanuman? You have an opportunity to serve Hanuman thousand times a day, isn't it? Not just that six to six fifteen in the morning. Thousand times a day you can offer a garland to Hanuman. And this guy gets all tear, teary eyed, and he says, "Wow, Swamiji, nobody has offered me that perspective." I can offer service to Hanuman not at six in the morning, but entire day. My entire day is karma yoga. Karma yoga through bhakti. Very powerful. Work done is verily yoga. Work is worship. Yoga karma shukaushala, isn't it? Now I can offer frisk everybody thinking I'm offering a garland to Hanuman. Similarly, you and I, you may be a consultant, lawyer, doctor, engineer, but Every moment of your life can become karma yoga through bhakti. By, by even if you are sending a bad email to a client, you can say that this is a chance for me to worship Krishna. How should I write? You're purifying yourself at that moment. There is no irritation. I am Krishna offering a meal to get Sarvam Krishna Paramastu. That's a famous thing, isn't it? Whatever you eat, everything is for Krishna. Of course, the ego comes in. Uh, in bhakti. That's why karma yoga is important. So bhakti, you will say Krishna and you will eat that extra two laddus and say Krishna is eating it. But but true karma through bhakti says that everything is an opportunity. My work is an opportunity to serve Krishna. And then ego gets resolved. So the advantage of karma yoga is that it is the only yoga which allows you to engage with the world. But the disadvantage of karma yoga is that remember you're pushing yourself to work, which means you're increasing the risk of multiplying desires. Even people who start off with karma yoga, people imagine NGO owners and CEOs, people who do good work. They start off emancipating the society of evils. Then what happens? They get a Nobel Peace Prize. I'm not talking about anybody in specific. Nobel Peace Prize, that prize, this prize. Then what happens after two years? They're traveling the world, collecting prices and making speeches. And they've forgotten the initial good work of, uh, of, of, uh, of helping the society. So karma yoga is a razor's edge. You can easily become outward force. <coughs> Samsara remembers is the biggest magnet in the world. <coughs> it is, has the power to pull you. You have a mind and samsara. So that's the easiest seductive pull. So karma yoga is razor's edge. 
karma yoga through knowledge is understanding that you are not required <coughs> it is the causation karma playing itself out you are not required remove that doership that is cause and effect cause and effect understanding is what you are not required the world works as per cause and effect if you deserve something you get it if you don't deserve something you won't get it don't don't infuse your doership on the world and karma yoga out of bhakti says i will spiritualize my entire day i cannot spirituality will always lose if it's limited to half an hour in the morning for jnana half an hour in the evening for meditation spirituality will always lose why because 10 hours a day you are engaging with samsara and multiplying desires how can spirituality win so spirituality to win karma yoga is equally important but karma yoga is a razor's edge because this side a little a little that side and you are absorbed again with the world it's you difficult to come back to karma yoga so to conclude today's session we saw there are four paths to freedom to liberation jnana yoga karma yoga bhakti yoga raja yoga the usp of jnana yoga is that knowledge dispels ignorance instantaneously the the drawback of jnana yoga is that you end up intellectualizing it and you still are an irritable person the test is your own everyday life that may not have improved just with jnana yoga the advantage of raja yoga meditation is that it promises experience not just knowledge it promises that you feel you can experience that shudder the shiver the light whatever they call it <laughs> one with samadhi the disadvantage of the 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 trap the terms and conditions of raja yoga is that um uh, you shun the, you have to shun the world it is difficult for a raja yogi to enjoy the world and uh, remove the mind bhakti yoga the 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 usp of bhakti yoga is that you can circumvent the entire difficult process of stabilizing the mind just by infusing love add one more desire and your job is done but that desire needs to be very strong otherwise you use that desire to do what you want that is the problem with bhakti yoga you end up getting emotional and using bhakti to do what you want see you cannot with bhakti yoga you've lost the license to complain huh with bhakti yoga you have lost the license to complain if you are a true bhakti bhakta because you cannot have bhakti yoga and complain that your daughter is doing something that you don't like or your friend is doing something that irritates you that is separation bhakti yoga you have lost that that's the problem with bhakti yoga uh, you 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 make it emotional and ritual in nature rather than yoga in nature and karma yoga the advantage is that it the only yoga that helps you engage with the world and the disadvantage of karma yoga is that it's a razor's edge it's easy to fall into the world and not this side of realization but that side of realization now the last two minutes let's end with what should you do what are all these yogas for where should you start vivekananda says each of these yogas have the power to liberate you however it's useful not to put your eggs in one basket <laughs> so a good investor like my my b school investor would always say um, put your eggs in multiple baskets in terms of have a portfolio of investment um, uh, uh, don't invest in one similarly an extreme form a pristine form of any of these yogas are all the same it's all liberation the second arrow goes away there is no suffering buddha says suffering is the problem happiness is not the problem happiness is your current state you already are happy suffering is the problem it creates by the mind and all four yoga says the same thing it's all creates mind creates that how you dispel that suffering through four yogas so all four are important however each of us are naturally gravitated to a certain yoga so don't put pressure on yourself saying that i'm not able to understand jnana advaita is too philosophical for me too terse for me or i'm not able to sit down and meditate too hard i'm not able to achieve samadhi or i'm not able to uh, have that bhakti towards krishna i'm not able to see krishna everywhere is my mistake <laughs> or i'm not work still irritates me. so don't be mean to yourself because not all four yogas are equally easy for all of us but if you spend enough time 
you will realize that one of it comes naturally to you. One of it is comes more naturally to you than the others, depending on your own mind and your own temperament, your own karma. One of it will come naturally to you. Start there. However, don't stop there. Ensure you cover through the entire cycle and do all four. If you want to follow Bhakti Yoga, follow Bhakti Yoga. Have a time, space, a prayer room in your house. Uh, add that object of desire, which circumvents all the other desires. However, don't stop there. Don't become just ritualistic, symbolistic in nature. Try to acquire jnana. But don't do that too much because if you're not naturally that. Have a little jnana to ensure bhakti doesn't go overboard in the wrong way. So avidya maya should not become, vidya maya should not become avidya maya. If you're naturally, uh, if intellectual prowess seeks you, start with jnana yoga. Start with drik drishya viveka, pancha kocha viveka. It will satiate your intellectual curiosity like nothing else in this world. Brahma Satyam Jagat Mitya. But don't stop there. It becomes intellectual. Infuse it with love. Love and service, karma. Then the jnana takes better shape. So complete the cycle and then you will realize that the test of this is that the second arrow will start getting removed slowly. And later you'll realize we are all in the same uh, storm. But you are in a boat that doesn't get affected. Let's close today's uh, session uh, with, uh, with just focus again and reflect on what we have seen today. And ask yourself after the session, which of these yogas speak to you most? Which of these yogas are you currently at? And how you can uh, move ahead. Thank you all. And sorry for taking 15 minutes extra. Have a great week. As usual, uh, put your thoughts on the WhatsApp group. This session happened because of your thoughts in the WhatsApp group and your emails to me. Feel free to reach out to me for any questions or doubts and have a great week. Thank you all.